Greetings, and welcome to the Dorian LPG third quarter 2021 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. A brief question-and-answer session will follow the formal presentation. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. Additionally, a live audio webcast of today's conference call is available on Dorian LPG's website, which is www.dorianlpg.com. I would now like to turn the conference over to Ted Young, Chief Financial Officer. Thank you, Mr. Young. Please go ahead. Thank you, Rob. Good morning, everyone, and thank you all for joining us for our third quarter 2021 results conference call. With me today are John Hajibateris, Chairman, President, and CEO of Dorian LPG Limited, John Lacouris, Chief Executive Officer of Dorian LPG USA, and Tim Hansen, Chief Commercial Officer. As a reminder, this conference call webcast and replay of this call will be available through February 9, 2021. Many of our remarks today contain forward-looking statements based on current expectations. These statements may often be identified with words such as expect, anticipate, believe, or similar indications of future expectations. Although we believe that such forward-looking statements are reasonable, we cannot assure you that any forward-looking statements will prove to be correct. These forward-looking statements are subject to known and unknown risks of uncertainties and other factors as well as general economic conditions. Should one or more of these risks or uncertainties materialize or should underlying assumptions or estimates prove to be incorrect, actual results may vary materially from those we expressed today. Additionally, let me refer you to our unaudited results for the period in December 31, 2020 that were filed this morning on Form 10-Q. In addition, please refer to our previous filings on Form 10-K, where you'll find risk factors that could cause actual results to differ materially from those forward-looking statements. With that, I'll turn over the call to John Hajibateris. Thank you, Ted. Good morning from uh, Connecticut, where John, Ted, and I are uh, speaking to you from different locations, and from um, Copenhagen, where Tim Hansen will, has joined. Uh, I appreciate all of you joining us this morning to discuss our third quarter results. Today, we're happy to announce a $100 million self-tender offer. Having considered various options, our board decided the tender offer presents a very compelling way to return cash to our shareholders. It accomplishes our main goal of making a meaningful distribution while at the same time maximizing financial and option value for all our shareholders. We believe that investors will value the optionality of our approach as those who wish to receive cash can sell as much of their holdings as fits their needs, and those who wish to increase their ownership have that flexibility as well. Through continued cooperation with our customers, various regulatory bodies, and local governments, We've been performing our work remotely when possible during the ongoing pandemic. Digitalization and remote monitoring have enhanced efficiency, offsetting some of the higher costs associated from COVID while reducing potential exposure to the disease. Though through these efforts, our seafarers and shore staff remain safe and able to perform their duties as we continue to focus on providing our customers safe, reliable, and clean and trouble-free transportation. The financial results for the quarter are even better than we expected on last quarter's call on the potential effect that the combination of large amounts of U.S. supply coming online, a heavy dry docking schedule for the global fleet, and the potential impact of a cold Asian winter could have on the market. While rates have fallen dramatically from a dizzy peak, The market environment remains promising, and we think that it is sustainable for some time. We expect that dry docking and maintenance on the global fleet will likely have a stronger impact this year than last year. A wave of U.S. infrastructure came online during 2020 that was weighted towards the end of the year, introducing introducing a large amount of spare export capacity and product supply to the market. At the same time, Continued production cuts from OPEC Plus are decreasing supply out of the Middle East, leaving only U.S. product to meet global demand. U.S. LPG exports have returned to China, where new PDH plants continue to start up. Indian and other export markets continue to grow. We continue to be a believer in the cargo that our fleet transports. LPG is a clean and flexible fuel amongst those that will bridge the potential 
transition to alternative energy. Next, Ted Young will, predict, will provide an analysis of our quarterly financials, followed by Tim Hansen on the markets and John LeCourse with an update of our environmental and operational activity. Ted, Mike's yours. Thanks, John. <clears throat> My comments today will focus on our financial position and results and our, unaud and our uh, liquidity, as well as some commentary on the self-tender offer announced today. At December 31, 2020, we had $133.6 million of free cash. As of Friday, January 29th, our cash balance stood at $149.3 million. The increase since year-end is reflective of the strong charter and results that we are currently seeing. Turning briefly to the tender, at the tender price of $13.50 per share and based on the $49.9 million shares outstanding, uh, currently outstanding, we would be repurchasing 7.4 million shares or about 14.8% of the shares currently outstanding. Based on charters booked and our expected expenditures, we, incurly, we currently anticipate that we will generate roughly 50, 60, uh, 50 to 60 million of free cash flow this quarter, including the cash already generated in January. Thus, even after accounting for the $100 million buyback, we would maintain a cash balance that is consistent with our approach to balance sheet management without any borrowings. In addition, the buyback is accretive to shareholders' equity per share, a key valuation metric for the investment community. Overall, we view this transaction as an efficient and highly accretive way to return capital to our shareholders. Further details on the mechanics and logistics will be available later today via the SEC website. For the discussion of our third quarter results, you may also find it useful to refer to the investor highlights slides posted this morning on our website. Turning to our third quarter chartering results, we achieved total utilization of 96.2% for the quarter with a daily TCE, that's time charter equivalent revenue over operating days, as both those terms are defined in our filings, of $42,298, yielding utilization adjusted TCE, that's TC revenue per available day, of about $40,690. This quarter saw steady month-over-month -month improvements in rates and utilization. Spot TCE per available day, which reflects our portion of the net profits of the Helios pool for the quarter, was about $41,754. Overall, the Helios pool reported a spot TCE, including TCAs, uh, t t uh, including COAs, of approximately $45,237 per available day. Our daily OPEX for the quarter was $9,189, excluding amounts expensed for dry dockings. It was $9,487, including those costs. Sequentially, OPEX was down, reflecting overall strong cost containment. Our time charter in expense remained relatively stable at $4.4 million. As a reminder, we do not include time charter in costs in our vessel operating expenses. Total GNA for the quarter was $5.5 million, and cash GNA, i.e., GNA excluding non-cash comp expense was about $5 million, which was down about 10% from the preceding quarter. We continue to look for efficiencies in our cost structure. Our reported adjusted EBITDA for the quarter was $60.1 million. Similar to our chartering results, we saw steady month-over-month -month increases in EBITDA this quarter. As a reminder, we look at cash interest expense on our debt as the sum of the line item's interest expense, excluding deferred financing fees and other loan expenses, and realized gain loss on interest rate swap derivatives. On that basis, total cash interest expense for the quarter was $6 million, representing a $900,000 reduction from last quarter. <clears throat> as I mentioned last quarter, we did blend and extend our $200 million notional swap, which resulted in our extending its maturity by three years to 2025, and reducing the fixed interest rate from 1.933% to 1.091%. We also did a similar transaction on our $50 million swap, which resulted in a decrease in rate from just over 2% to 1.145%. This swap remains at $50 million notional until March 2022, at which point it will begin to amortize. So uh, a big part of the reduction that we uh, witnessed was due to those uh, favorable blend and extend transactions in the swaps. Overall, we continue to benefit from our hedging policy and the favorable pricing of our Japanese financing, leaving, with us, leaving us with a current interest cost fixed hedge and a small floating piece of 3.71%. 
As reporting matter, our realized and unrealized gain loss on derivatives also include the effect of, F of our FFA portfolio. The calculation of EBITDA in our filings, however, only adds back the interest on the realized gain loss, not the FFA piece. John will touch on our dry docking program, but our remaining dry docking commitments are quite manageable from a financial perspective. Although we currently hold a roughly 70% economic interest in Helios, we do not consolidate its P&L or balance sheet accounts, which has the effect of understating our cash and working capital. Thus, we believe it is useful to provide some in additional insight in order to give a more complete picture of our financial condition. As of Monday, February 1, the pool had roughly $45.7 million of cash on hand. We feel that our liquidity and capital structure have positioned us well for any rate environment, and we believe that this allows our company to make capital allocations, such as the one announced this morning, from a position of strength. Our board's decision to begin a $100 million self-tender underscores its commitment to shareholder value creation and aggressively returning cash to shareholders when appropriate. Assuming successful completion of this tender offer, we will have repurchased roughly 16.3 million shares representing over 28% of the shares outstanding following our IPO in 2014. We continue to remain interested in accretive growth opportunities that meet our risk-reward criteria as well. We will continue to be prudent in deploying cash, but our financial position allows us to act quickly on meaningful opportunities as they may arise. With that, I'll pass it over to Tim Hansen. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, for the calendar year 2020, the global seaborne LTP volumes fell by over 2% year on year, 206.8 million tons. For calendar quarter volumes totaled 27 million tons, uh, a less than 1% decrease versus the same quarter in 2019. U.S. export growth continues to counterbalance the Middle East volumes that fell to about 4 million tons. Meanwhile, in 2020, American export volumes increased by 16% to 46 million tons, compared to only 39.7 million tons last year. And for the second quarter in a row, U.S. export volumes hit the record levels. Year-on-year -year export volumes in the fourth quarter grew by 18.8% to 12.9 million uh, metric tons. The American export volumes hit a monthly record of 4.4 million tons in October, and a record again beaten in December with 4.5 million metric tons. The cold Asian winter increased demand while new export capacity came online in December with EGP's expansions of the Netherlands uh, terminal being completed. The Baltic market index, the Russell Nova Chiba route, averaged $76 per metric tons in the last quarter. Rates, rates increased at the, as the quarter progressed, increasing from $55 per ton at the beginning of the quarter to over $100 per ton for the most of December. Several contributing factors drove last quarter's rate strings. Delays in the Panama Canal caused waiting times to increase dramatically during the quarter. This was caused by heavily container traffic uh, and an overall increase in transits. Also, COVID-related inefficiencies uh, and U.S. Gulf and Asian port delays caused by winter weather further increased the utilization of the fleet. In addition to the elevated number of ships out of trading due to dry dock and other surveys. At the same time, global LPG demand increased substantially, particularly from Asia with an unusual cold weather leading to a relative shortage of gas in the region for residential and commercial purposes. Also high LNG prices in addition uh, to drawing uh, LNG cars from the U.S., and creating a boom in the LNG market, incentivize substitution of LNG with LPG in industrial applications. With a resilient LPG, US LPG production and low inventory draws until December, until Christmas, uh, Mount Bellevue priced competitively and opened the West East arbitrage in mid-November, which remained open for the remainder of the quarter. The open arbitrage towards each East made traditional investment-based players send cargoes to the East as well, as margins was better uh, versus the cracker economics in Europe against NAFTA, which created additional turmoils. On the supply side, concerns over the U.S. and gel production volumes remains. Propane storage levels are tracking well below 
uh, both last year's levels and the trading five months average. How, however, we, be, we continue to believe that U.S. supply uh, will supply the global demand gap left uh, from the lower Middle East uh, production due to Saudi cuts. Saudi Arabia have agreed to take a brunt of the new OPEC cuts in favor of Russia for February and March. This could remove four to five years to seize cargoes or about 200,000 tons of LPG from the market for the two months. Although rates have come off uh, over the past weeks on the back of increased U.S. prices, um, which have closed the arbitrage and resulting in a few U.S. cargo cancellations, prices are now adjusting and look more positive. Uh, and we have seen market activity picking up again. High utilization of the Panama Canal to continue, resulting in a sustained delays and more regular UDC routing around the Cape of Good Hope. We remain optimistic looking into 2020. With that, I'll pass it on to John for environmental and field update. Thank you, Tim. In the last calendar quarter of 2020, we completed dry docking and third special survey on our vessel Captain John NP. In the past couple of weeks of January, we completed dry docking and first and first special sur survey on our vessel Commodore. We plan to fit two ships with scrubbers during this quarter, which will complete our announced scrubber program and carry out those vessels' five-year dry docking cycles. We expect outlays of six to eight million dollars over the next couple of months, uh, quarters. Sorry, during 2020. Crude oil prices saw an extreme volatility, as have bunker fuel prices. The very low self of fuel oil price spread, however, has steadily priced at 20 to 25 percent premium above that of heavy fuel oil bunker fuel. Um, even though in absolute dollars, this spread ranged from a high of $300 per metric ton down to $50 per metric ton. It currently stands at about $100 per metric ton. As we look back to IMO 2020 launch last year, we are now very confident that the decision to install hybrid scrubbers was justified, not only economically, but also environmentally. Our fleet of hybrid scrubber vessels averaged 0.04% to 0.07% sulfur oxide emissions, SOX emissions, against the blended and problematic fuel oils of 0.5 and 0.1 percent sold to shipping for the year. As we have previously reported, scrubbers also reduce particulate matter and black carbon emissions by 80 percent, keeping in line with environmental sustainability. We continue to invest in our vessel's performance and efficiency in achieving reduced emissions and lowering operating costs. An improved environmental footprint is very important to Dorian LPG, and we hope to continue with additional energy efficiency technologies to our vessels, including dual fuel batteries and fuel cells. Dorian has been at the forefront of LPG dual fuel technology since 2013 and 2014 when first new building vessels were ordered and uh, we followed that development closely since then. After the most recent LPG dual fuel retrofits get into regular service, and when the first new building dual fuel vessels deliver from the shipyards, we hope to revisit this opportunity and consider our options. <clears throat> Given that the LGC fleet aged for fire last year, it would have been a significant number of vessels uh, for dry docking, which would have removed from trading. But this year, we expect to see even stronger trends. According to some brokers, as many as 90 ships could opt for dry docking maintenance this year, which would almost be one-third of the current global fleet. With a strong freight rate environment the second half of last year and increasing COVID-19 disruptions at the yards, many owners deferred maintenance, which is pushed now into 2021. Considering LPG dual fuel engine retrofits, ballast water treatment installation, and some scrubber retrofits, 
more ships could be out of the global fleet this year for longer periods than last year. The current fleet order book remains at reasonable levels and supports the VLCC market for the medium term. It currently sta stands at 39 vessels, or about 13% of the fleet, with about 21 vessels expended in 2021, 13 vessels in 2022, and 9 in 2023. There are currently 30 vessels in the fleet that are aged 25 years or older, which equals to about 10% of the current fleet. And with that, I will pass it over to John Hadjipateras. There we are. Uh, thank you, John. Um, Rob, do we have any questions? Thank you. Um, with the prepared remarks completed, we'll now open the line for questions. If you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad, and a confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you'd like to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. Thank you. And our first question comes from the line of Sean Morgan with Evercore ISI. Please proceed with your questions. Hey, guys. Um, so in light of this you know, large buyback and return of capital to shareholders, I think you still have $50 million reauthorized on the buyback authorization for the rest of the year, uh, or at least through the rest of the calendar year. How do you think about how aggressive you'll be in terms of timing of using that and to what extent you use it? Will it be just dependent on the path of the share price? And, and sort of how do you think about that, that reauthorization of the buyback in, in, in light of, of the change in circumstances with this big chunk of cash being used right up front uh, for this tender offer? Uh, thanks for the question, Sean. No, it's, it's there. It will remain as an author authorization. And um, it will be, as before, evaluated on, on uh, taking all, all the factors into consideration, the, uh, including the price, including um, the, the uh, success, hopefully, of the um, um, uh, tender and uh, the, the market, the freight market. Okay. And then I got I have one here for Tim um, regarding the Panama Canal. You, you talked about this utilization spike between you know, LPG vessels, LNG vessels, and, and container ships. Do we see this as, as kind of a seasonal uptick for a one-time event, or is this sort of a new normal uh, where all three of these, these vessel categories are using the Panama Canal to an extent that it's going to become sort of capacity constrained on an ongoing basis? Okay. I think for uh, for contain yeah oh, sorry. can you hear me yeah I can hear you yeah 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 go ahead yeah okay uh, yeah I, I think there there are some seasonality in it uh, naturally but container ships uh, uh, especially have have increased throughout the year um, by by I think uh, ninety plus more passages than the, than the year before and we, we see more container ships. Uh, being fitted uh, for the Panama and more lines going in that direction. So I think that's more on a continuous basis. Um, we have seen dry cargo, for example, increase quite uh, quite substantially, which, which has been uh, which we expect to be somewhat seasonal uh, due to the cold uh, winter in Asia and, and, and lack of uh, different uh, types of, of uh, coal also in, in uh, South America. And LNG also is, is somewhat seasonal, uh, but we have seen an increase in, in transit uh, throughout the year, but especially this cold spell that, that we have in, uh, in Asia, and, and which we still is in Asia, has, has drawn uh, a lot more LNG in, in that direction. But totally, we, we're seeing like the uh, uh, increase of passages in the canal by, by more than 200 uh, transits since uh, 2019 and in, in 2020. So. So overall, we believe that, that there will be more, uh, um, let's say, uh, delays in the Panama Canal, but it will also have some seasonal swings. Okay, and so in light of that, as you're managing the Dorian fleet, has that resulted in in Dorian just waiting at the Panama Canal longer, uh, along with a lot of other global players, or or are you actually having to send ships around 
the long way around Africa from like the U.S. Gulf to to Asia. We are sending uh, ships around uh, the, the Cape. I think, that, uh, especially as the uh, delays in the Panama Canal uh, surge up to to twelve to fourteen days, the the economics actually uh, from from going on boat through the canal and, and waiting for that long justified the sending uh, sending ships around the Cape, even from the north part of Asia. And and still we are seeing eight to ten base delays. Uh, so maybe the infection point moved a little bit southerly, but but uh, but yeah, we we will send ships in in that direction uh, more because these delays also surge quite a lot and 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 makes it hard to plan the next uh, the next cargoes. You can say also we 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 have some Panama slots booked throughout the years, uh, so we can schedule around those. But uh, as you saw on, on, on uh, New Year's Eve, uh, the Panama Canal has uh, has changed the regulations for booking of, uh, of Panama slots, so that is no longer possible to, for LPG carriers to to pre-book slots. So uh, from from uh, from 2021, uh, 2022 onwards. Uh, sorry. So so um, so that will also change again the, uh, the the dynamics of the Panama Canal transit uh, in the future. This year, okay. there is a number of players who have. Sean, of course, that Yeah, yeah, Sean, you can. Oh, that obviously has a positive effect on on miles. So it's uh, right. Uh, yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. As a reminder to ask a question today, you may press star one from your telephone keypad. The next question is from the line of Omar Nokta with Clarkson's Plateau. Please proceed with your questions. Yeah, hi, thank hi, you. Oh. Hey guys. Hi, hope you're uh, able to handle the snow okay. <laughs> um, the, uh, obviously just wanted to, you know, clearly the, the $100 million uh, self-tender offers is clearly the most aggressive shareholder reward program you guys have, have done since being public and, you know, with the firepower you have, the earnings momentum and, uh, and clearly the valuation, it makes a lot of sense. But I wanted to ask, you know, with that, how do you feel about, you know, reinvesting in the business? Um, you know, clearly the market has become, or at least it appears to be very tight uh, over the past, call it a year, two years, aside from the COVID window there that lasted a couple of months. Um, do, do you feel that the market, is short on vessels. Clearly, there is some of that. But how do you feel about your positioning? Do you think it makes sense to to, to grow, or are you more content with uh, returning capital? Um, Omar, we're not we're not uh, 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 we, we're not excluding growth, but we are focused first on return um, at, at this stage. The the, the the com- is much more compelling to do um, uh, to return money to our shareholders than it is to um, um, acquire ships. That's a very precise and, and concise answer to your question. I think. Yeah. No. That, that, that's fair. And you know the the maybe just thinking about the spot market, it's been fairly robust uh, and. We haven't really seen much time charter activity, I think maybe from my perspective. Um, is that the case as, as how you see it? Um, do you see the, the period market opening up? or Because I know in the past you've been more willing to put vessels on contract, but we haven't really seen that uh, the past several quarters. How could you describe the period market right now? I'll, I'll let Tim answer that. Okay. Um, yeah, I think we have seen... Uh, some activity big in, in uh, October, November for, for shorter term time charters, so one to two years. Uh, I think still for the longer term deals, uh, that has been very limited. I think people is also looking ahead of what types of ships and, and what will the regulations and so on encompass. But but short term, before we saw the, the, the spike or, or the beginning of the spike, we did see uh, quite a lot of renewal of ships, which for, for for one to two year, which is normal for that time of of, of year, so so uh, where, where yeah, all the contracts would come into uh, to renewal. I think also we we saw a very difficult product market just leading up to fourth quarter, uh, calendar quarter. Uh, so so at, at that 
at that time, most traders was very, very cautious of, of committing to anything. Um, so, so that might have been the reason for, for you seeing a little bit less activity in that front than, than previous years. Thank you. Uh, and then just maybe just on maybe the topic of U.S. exports, um, you touched on this a bit in the in the opening uh, comments. Um, you know, this uh, trying to think about it from say what happened this past summer when the VLGC market came to life after the the, the spring uh, shutdown, um, and you know things started to come to life despite you know the the OPEC plus cuts or the Middle East cuts, and the U.S. made for a lot of those lost volumes. Um, and, uh, and really grabbed some market share, and that kind of sprung the LGCs um, to higher levels. You know, with the Saudis now talking about taking off a million barrels of crude here in February and again in March, uh, could you see a similar situation arising? You know, that being a loss of Middle East cargoes being replaced with with the U.S. Uh, Tim, you want to have a job at it? Yeah, I know that. Yeah, I think we could see something uh, something similar, um, where the demand in, in the in the east is really uh, is still there. So, so it's definitely not uh, no appetite for the for the tons. They are, they are definitely there. So when tons are uh, when we're seeing export cuts out of the Middle East, uh, we we expect them to be replaced by by U.S. and uh, and also uh, on, on the back of uh, we should see improved uh, oil price and, and, and thereby making uh, uh, fracking uh, more attractive in the U.S. as well. Um, and we see, we also saw this uh, earlier the, the year that, that when tons are lacking, then then uh, uh, basically uh, the, the, the tons that, that, that could go into an after fracking will, will then go into the other demand in Asia. So. So we think we see the the cut of Saudis uh, uh, that these tons will be replaced and will be replaced in the east by U.S. tons, which should get more tonnage as well, or will get more tonnage as well. Yeah, yeah. It'll be interesting Omar, to see. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, the, 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 I think it, the dynamic of the increased ton mile from that and from the ca- canal has been very helpful. So. We've seen continued volatility, and, and, and uh, this year uh, we've got to be thankful for it because even though the volatility took us down to break even early last year, it brought us up to uh, wonderful um, returns at the end of the year. Now um, the market sold off again, but on, on average, I think probably we would be we would be looking at um, prospects that are um, better. Even than we had anticipated last year for for going forward. So, yeah, yeah, I agree with that definitely. And and maybe John, just one final uh, one final question. And I've asked you this before on calls, and you've been pretty firm with the response. But how do you feel about investing in new buildings um, today? Are there customers requesting that of you? Um, well, no, we haven't seen that yet. And I and I do think the new building market is getting to um, uh, an inflection point where I think that the, 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 the prices have been either sl- sliding or, or steady for a long time, and the next, the next uh, move will be up. Um, but uh, but um, uh, I've, thought, I've, I've thought that before. <laughs> so uh, I don't think there's a rush to do anything, certainly not for us. And uh, certainly not for the rest of the market. The, 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 we can handle the, the fleet can handle the demand that's there, and um, it, it's it's a challenge going forward for not just our sector but all sectors to know uh, wh- what kind of fuel mix to put into to the future when you're designing and, and, and building ships for the future. In our case, in the LPG business, it's a bit easier because. The obvious answer would be LPG uh, as a dual as a dual fuel, um, but you know we we do look at it. We continue to look at it, but we're not there yet. We have, and as I said before, we're prioritizing um, uh, return to shareholders and at the, at the prices at a price of our um, of our uh, stock. Uh, we continue to think the best way to do it is. By what we've done, uh, we've announced today. 
Very good. Th thanks, John. That's very clear. Thank you, Omar. Thank you. At this time, we've reached the end of a lot of time for questions, and I will turn the call back to management for closing remarks. Thank you very much. I think I'm, uh, my closing remarks is thank you all for joining us, and I hope that you join us again next quarter, and we have even better news for you then. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone. This concludes today's conference. You may disconnect your lines at this time. Thank you for your participation.